Hello everybody. So this is one of our videos for Alternative August and I'm hoping everybody's going to really enjoy this and we're all going to learn a lot. Today I have with me Mike Ingram who you have met before. So hopefully Mike is familiar to you and we are going to talk about the English Civil War. Now one thing that we have to make very clear or possibly two things at this point is that there is a lot of this uh, there's a lot of english civil war you know entire huge volumes are written on the english civil war so the first thing is that we're clearly not going to be covering everything today are we no, no we, it's just going to be a brief introduction to the first part yes. um we have to remember that there's not one english civil war there's actually three mm -hmm. and also uh modern day uh, suggestion is that it shouldn't even be called the English Civil War, but called the War of the Three Kingdoms. Because I of that, because it's a lot of it centres around the Scottish and the Irish as well. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, so it, it it's a huge, as you said, a huge, huge subject. Yeah. So, so we we can only begin to give you an idea. Yeah. Um, today about it. And this is going to be um, because. Some of you might have known when I've said before that a lot of the things that I'm talking about in these topics are things that I don't know a massive amount about myself. And I'm so, so I'm doing some a bit of research before I come in and I do these videos, but the people that I'm speaking to are obviously the real, real experts in these things. So I don't have quite as much that I can add into these conversations as with the ones, the Tudory and the Wars of the Roses ones that I've done. So a lot of them are more of perhaps a superficial overview of a lot of stuff in places. But it does mean that because we can only cover part of this today, we have lots of scope, if people have enjoyed all these, to come back another time and do the English Civil War, round two, <laughs> part two, the sequel, if you yes. like. So, yeah, so there's three little, well, varying lengths of mini war, if you like, within this period. And it's actually a period sort of, I'm sure a lot of you know that it starts with this and then we have the Commonwealth and when it ends with the Commonwealth. And this period actually is only about 20 years, isn't it? It's yes. actually a vast, vast, vast amount of time. And they pack a lot in, in this 20 years. It, it, it really goes on, I suppose you can say the start of it really begins when Charles takes becomes king uh, and actually goes right through his reign and through the Commonwealth really until Charles II takes the throne. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his... uh, and, and although you've got the main uh, the main periods that the first civil war and the second civil war and the third civil war and so on and so forth uh, there are lots of other rebellions and attempted comings back um, such as the good old cause which is 1662 mm. so it's well after the wars i suppose is officially finished but it looks but don't think that with the end of charles and then the the death of cromwell that it's the end it's not it's still still going on a little bit afterwards well it's it's, it's the same with the tudors isn't it you know you're well, bosworth there we go that's it they're the yes. end of one, it? and you know you have the battle of stoke field a couple of years later but even then these tensions were rumbling underneath for, for decades weren't they? yes yeah and uh, even, and you know, e even the execution of margaret pole all that time later some people still look at that as a remnant of the wars of the roses yes yeah yeah and, definitely uh, floated back to the tudors <laughs> so yes. Charles the first comes to the throne not massively popular if we're being honest about it no and, and I think he has a few hang-ups from his father's rule as well that sort of added into it uh, and then he goes of course and marries a catholic yeah um, which wasn't the thing at the time no and, and this is something we were talking about earlier we mustn't forget that this is happening only 40 years after the death of Elizabeth the mm first -hmm which is absolutely no time whatsoever mm. and of how fervent Protestant the country was. Yes. And, and so that gives you an idea of, of how cataclysmic it would have been thought throughout. And, and of course, then that goes on because one of the other things um, Charles does is he has um, Archbishop Lord as the, um, 
uh, Archbishop of Canterbury and starts issuing loads of new rules uh, and brings in a new prayer book. Uh, and this is starts to cre create havoc everywhere because for the first time you, you've then got Scotland and England united. Mm -hmm. He tries to impose the new uh, um, the new book on on the Scottish, which of course they don't want. Uh, because they're, they're pretty much Presbyterian uh, and um, the religion that's being promoted is, is generally called Armenianism um, uh, and, and that's where a lot of it comes from uh, and it's it's very high Anglican oh and, right, okay oh, uh, and that's a whole other topic isn't it it is <laughs> uh, but, but it, it's very it's very 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 close to being Catholicism again mm. Yeah. And again, that starts to create unrest. Yes, very much so. Um, so yeah. in, in the short so in the short version, we get the, the Scottish then effectively rebelling against the English. Mm. Uh, and we have a the Scottish war that goes on. Yes. It is interesting because when I was sort of revising this a little bit, I'd forgotten how much as you say, why is it just called the English Civil War? Because the heavy involvement and influence of the Scots and of the Irish as well. Anyway, <laughs> I could just go off on lots of, down lots of rabbit holes here. So Charles I was not somebody who liked to be held accountable for his actions or told no, or wanted to hear anything that didn't do him. And th that never goes well. So in 1640, he is forced to recall Parliament because he wants some money, but he hadn't recalled Parliament for 11 years, which is a crazy amount of time. What happened? <laughs> um, basically, he, he recalls them in 1640 to um, raise money for this war with the Scots, mm. um, because obviously he needs money to do it. Um, the Parliament's more interested in sorting out um, their bigger issues with Charles being king rather than, than granting money. Um, so they refuse to grant him money and after three weeks Charles closes the Parliament. That's why it's called the Short Parliament. Short Parliament, yeah. It's just, yeah. I can't believe that he hadn't recalled Parliament for 11 years. No, exactly. That is absolutely yeah. crazy. Uh, and this again is one of the big things that's that's a big cause of the of the war when it eventually happens is, is the fact that he wants personal rule mm. and he doesn't want people to disagree with him as as, as you say uh, but he needs the money so so he does it um, Parliament ends and then he has to resort to other forms of raising money and we start getting things like ship money being introduced right. Uh, ship, ship money. Oh, you're going to. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. ship money effectively means is that if you're in a port, um, you have to give so much money to pay for a new ship to be built mm. for your fleet. But he doesn't just hold it to um, the people in the ports. He expects the whole country to pay ship money, and you start. To, it, it's another another cause of, of problems going on throughout the country that. He's trying to raise money. Uh, he does it several times. He's not particularly successful at raising money. And some counties just flatly refuse to pay it. Mm. He then introduces another form. It's just taxation by another form. Yeah. Um, so another one that he introduces uh, is coat and conduct money, which is to pay for the soldiers fighting up in Scotland, um, which then adds to it on top of that one. And again, people rebel against it and they don't like it. And this is going on pretty much constantly that he's trying to raise money without having to recall Parliament. Right. And you can see why nobody is happy about that whatsoever. No, and, and they're taxing huge, huge amounts of people, e even the poor people. Um, and so it just builds and builds and builds. But in the end, he has to recall Parliament mm -hmm. uh, because he can't do anything else. And then that's again is where Parliament stands up to him and what's now known as the Long Parliament, which then continues effectively all the way through the 
most part of the, the Civil War. Yeah, it was a long parliament. Yeah, and, and we start to see these these characters coming forward, like John Pym, yeah. um, as, as being an, an important leader of all of them. I mean, it, it had obviously been bubbling um, in the background for, for quite a long while, and these people were having meetings. Um, Pym was meeting with like John Hampden, um, Arthur Hazelrig, who who were the the main people in in the five who he attempts to arrest, yes. which sort of participates. So uh, he wanted this money. He would call Parliament because he wanted the money to go to war with the Scots. So what was that all about? What was it? Him leading it? Was it them leading it? What exactly was it? that was going to potentially cause that conflict that he was trying to raise that money for? He, he wanted to go, go to what, this is what the, your two strands, the, the religion strand and the parliament strand then collide mm -hmm. because obviously the Scots have got the, um, don't want the new, uh, the new prayer book. Um, and as I say, they, they reject it. We end up having a, a shortish war and the Scots actually invade England. Mm. Uh, and for quite some time, they're in control of the north of England. Yeah. Uh, because of it. There's, there's only one battle, and it's not a particularly good one. And, and the English are actually quite soundly beaten, which also then sends shockwaves through England that the Scottish army has defeated the English. Yes, because, if I remember rightly, he had, Charles had a chap called Wentworth. Who's That's the one. one. And he was kind of sent off to lead the army and he kind of got there and went, oh, I don't like it and ran off. Exactly. And, and he had been, yeah. been in Ireland beforehand, um, being, I suppose, the, the general lieutenant in Ireland at the same time. He got executed at some point in the future, though, didn't he? He certainly did, yeah. Um, Parliament. Why? <laughs> they executed him. Yeah, it, for, for treason, basically, and Parliament. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, Deserting the crown. Yeah, so, so the Parliament puts a, uh, an act of attainder against him uh, and has him, has him executed. And that's one of the, again, it's one of the first big steps mm -hmm. that actually leads to the, to the Civil War. At the same time, or around that same time, they um, so, uh, executed the Archbishop of Canterbury, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, again, because, because of his beliefs and, and being quite strong about it. Yeah. Um, so it, again, it's it's these two strands coming together all the time, oh. um, and while this is going on, you've got the, I suppose, uh, the increased um, in, in Puritanism in the country, mm. um, which is strongly opposed to um, the Archbishop and and all the other things that are going on at the same time. It's it's like so it, 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 as I say, it gets complicated. It certainly does. <laughs> All right, now roundabout. Well, I'm just checking my notes. Sorry. So we just talked about Th Thomas Wentworth. That was it. Um, so you mentioned very briefly John Pym. Yep. So give tell me a little bit more about him and also the Triennial Act and the Habeas Corpus Act. Yes. Yeah. Th these. Um, and, and all of this that's been going on, uh, and the ship money, and the coat and conduct money, um, Charles is throwing people in prison um, at will, effectively, uh, and there's no no real protection for them. So if you sort of do it in reverse order, uh, so the Habeas Corpus Act of 1640 uh, is there to stop the king just arresting people at will and holding them in prison. And, and it still exists today, of course, but th this is the very beginnings of it and, and why it sort of starts uh, in the first place. Yeah. So you've got that there. And then the Triennial Act, uh, that was actually came in, in 1641, um, still in that same parliament. It's been going for a long while. And, and that's there to force the king um, to actually call parliament. Um, yes, right, yes. As it says, three times, three times a year. Um, because yeah, because he ignored them for such a long while. And that parliament also, and that act also gave that particular session of parliament permission to end itself, to choose when yes. it ended itself, rather than 
the king that's it. making the decision okay yeah, yeah because really even going back right through the tudor period uh, and actually before the whole purpose of parliament at that point was just to grant taxes mm. for the king mm. and so this this is where again you start to see parliament actually having um, more power mm. yeah. uh, and it's increasing over time yeah it's, and i i think you know we have this sort of today people say oh, well the queen's not got any power in the government and it's this this really long process that's taken us to this point of, of absolute monarchy really yes right yeah. through to where, where we are now where her, um, her majesty the queen is, is essentially a figurehead yeah uh, you know and, oh that's another topic <laughs> Sorry, we keep, <laughs> but yeah, but it, it's this, but it's around this time really that it's quite pivotal in where the tide is really starting to turn away from the monarch being sort of that, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and this is a huge, hugely, hugely it. slow process mm. because of start, it, it sort of starts with the Magna Carta, yeah, uh, and then you get the um, the Second Barons' War. Um, when you start to get um, a parliament as, as such, because up until that point there wasn't really a such thing as a as a parliament, so it, it's taking a real long while for it to to evolve and, and form. Um, and by the time we get to the end of the Civil War and the Battle of Naseby and afterwards, we then have the the parliament that we know today. Yeah. So. It... So you, you can't look at it in isolation. It's a long, long process. That's, it's a really pivotal, pivotal point in that process, yes. isn't it? Which is yeah. so. Uh, yes, John Pym. Yes, so 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 John Pym effectively becomes the leader of Parliament, or the lead speaker, um, and he's the person who's who. Who initially, I think he, he looks no more than reforms. He he wants to to the reforms, but Charles is so. Um, set in his ways shall we say that the only way he can he can move forward it is is forcing these issues through mm. or, or tries to force these three through. and then of course it comes to a an absolute head in january 1642 um when charles with 400 soldiers goes into the houses house of commons uh, and tries to arrest the five members mm -hmm. they find about out about it uh, with only seconds to go, literally, uh, and managed to escape. Um, and this is where you, you get the famous quote of William Lethnall, the speaker, uh, actually saying, uh, I neither have the eyes to see or the tongue to speak in this place, except for how the House directs me. Uh, and if, if you watch the opening of the Houses of Parliament, that's reenacted every time Black Rod comes in and knocks on the door. And that actually goes back to that that moment, oh. uh, and that that's why it's there uh, yeah. as part of the thing. So so again, it's it's this process, and even even that little piece of black rod knocking on the door for the the queen to come into the the house all relates back to the, back to the civil war. Oh God, so many so much stuff, everybody, so much stuff. <laughs> okay, so um. There were events taking place in Ireland around this time as well. Um, yes. Quite pivotal. So um, the English, uh, sorry, the Irish nobles were obviously watching what was going on and they could see that concessions were being made to the Scots and to the English because, as you mentioned earlier, you know, um, the forces had got quite, the Scottish had got quite far into the north. Yes. And um, after Wentworth kind of legged it and that was that, Charles was using money to try or wanted money to try and pay the Scots off and to get them to move out of the north again to sort of yep. try to control that. So, of course, the Irish were going, well, hang on a minute. If you can have that and you can have that, what's in it for us? Basically, yes. this, this is my casual summary of this situation. <laughs> um, so give us some background on the Irish situation at the time and how this featured in the Grand Remonstrance in 1641. One of the um, difficulties in Ireland, of course, was that really you'd got English nobles 
who were supposedly English Protestant nobles, supposedly wow. running the country. However, over the years, and quite a considerable amount of years, uh, these English nobles had become very Irish. They'd married into Irish families. And, and so the distinction had, had more or less disappeared by that time. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the Irish rebelled again uh, against all of this. And we have a, a little battle. Um, Charles has to send troops over to Ireland to, to deal with it and sort it all out. Um, but he, does, he doesn't manage to do it again. It's... This, this is one of Charles's failings, I think, that he's not a, um, he doesn't really think about cause and effect <laughs> uh, and, and how they move along. Yeah. Um, but but that, that's, the, so that's the short version of it. In his own mind, he was right and that was it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So and he didn't see any different. Obstinate that he couldn't see past that. And that no. was, of course, literally his his downfall in the end <laughs> so you and, and he also has a number of courtiers um who were very much um got their own ideas as well um charles was actually quite well known for acting on the last courtier that spoke to him oh okay. <laughs> uh, or or his queen or, or whoever but that he had a very small group of people um oh. and this does affect things later on particularly in the conduct of the Civil War. I nearly forgot uh, about the Grand Remonstrance then, I nearly moved on. So <laughs> what was the Grand Remonstrance? Th this, this was basically a series of complaints. Right, okay. Uh, uh, no, nothing more, and it, and it was Pym who was behind them. And They've tried to uh, just put together all their... I'm going to use... All their grievances. Uh, yes, grievances or concerns, rather than just yeah. basically being downright sick of him. Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, so so you what, what you've got is, it's like a big stew that's bubbling away. Right, yeah. And you, you're, you're just getting to the stage now where the five are attempting to be arrested. Mm. Um, this is the, sort of the point where the, the stew starts to bubble up over the sides and you've got that horrible sticky mess going all over your cooker stage. He really, that, in going in, um, gung ho to arrest those people with troops. He made a really grave error. And as you say, it, it was the straw that broke the camel's back, really. It was turning the heat one degree up to bubble it over because everyone was then like, he's done all those things. And that's just tyrannical behaviour. Oh, it is, yes. He doesn't yeah. have the right, we have in law now that he doesn't have the right to just randomly, willy nilly arrest people whenever he feels like it. And you can't just arrest and imprison people because you don't happen to like them. Yeah, or they, and they don't agree with what you say, Yeah, which is, which is what it was, basically. If, if that's what happened, I'd have been in prison for a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, following all this, um, we have the Committee of Safety put into place. What's the Committee of Safety? It, it doesn't really become much until after the war really starts. Okay. Uh, and it, it effectively is the... The ruling body who conducts the war on the parliament side. Right. It, it's, a, it's a committee that conducts the war. Okay. Uh, and that, that then is in existence right through till uh, it goes on till after the war's over, actually. As many of these uh, things often do, but they kind of get sometimes a bit lost in the history, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Most people, so here we see the introduction and starting to come in with uh, the royalists and um, well, the roundheads and the cavaliers. Now, most people have heard of the roundheads and the cavaliers, haven't they? So, we're very much yeah. now starting to see people, but I, I must point out, out at this stage um, that they were actually contemporary insults for each other. Right. Okay. Rather than um, rather than, and they, you know, they they would call them. It was only as an insult that those those words okay. were used. So we'll say royalists and parliamentarians. That's it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But both sides at this point were starting to garner support yes. in whichever way they could, and look to their own advantages. So, for example. Um, Charles had a lot of support from the Scottish nobles, didn't he? 
Well, uh, yeah, and also the English nobles as well. Not all of them, but but generally, the nobility, um, those who sat in the House of Lords. Not all of them, but a lot of them supported Charles. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he impressed on them as well, didn't he? If they come for me, they'll come for you as well. Yeah. And, they'll yeah. and, and we find right at the beginning of um, the war, for example, in Northamptonshire, all the Northamptonshire nobility all leave uh, the county and go to support, um, support the king. Right. Because there were a lot of people as well who didn't want to be involved, weren't there? Who just were just, yeah. if anybody came from either side, they just tried to drive them out themselves. And you can understand yeah. people not wanting to get involved. It's an extremely sticky situation. Uh, and this is something else where this war is different to all the others. It's because it's the first real total war that involves everybody. Yeah, where, I, see, yeah I see. Yeah. Yeah. Where, whereas previous in the Wars of the Roses, it was just normally the the nobles knocking seven barrels out of each other and and f for the most part the civilians the people in the villages and the towns were left alone yeah yeah not always but but for the most part whereas this war drags everybody in and because of political or religious um beliefs or, or both you have whole families getting split down the middle and taking different sides um, some of them being royalist and some of them being parliamentarian. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it, as I say, that, that's why it's a total, uh, it's a total war. Um, and the poor people suffered far more than, than they ever had done before. Yeah. Because you would have one army coming through your village one day, um, taking all your property and your supplies, calling it taxing. And then perhaps a week later, you would have the other army coming through, mm. uh, taking everything. And sometimes you would have a, uh, a particular example it is um, uh, Charles sets up his headquarters at Oxford. And so they, they have cavalry patrols and cavalry raids going out from Oxford very regularly. So you might be in a village up on the um, Oxford border, which is far more... Um, parliamentarian for example you might get um, a royalist cavalry raid come through the village one day uh, and take tax your village and then a, a two weeks later you would have another cavalry patrol come through again another royalist cavalry patrol and come doing exactly the same again so it's relentless so it's, it, it's relentless and and it does drag everybody into it yeah. there are very few people who who don't get affected in one way or another uh, and going back to the fact as well that this was a war where, um, as, as we say, more people died in the Civil War per head of population than did in the First World War. Mm -hmm. And we know how badly and how horribly the First World War affected villages and, and towns in England during that time. No different back in 1630s, 1640s. And, you know, because the population was so much smaller, the loss of that number of people, even as a, like, a, not just in terms of a uh, percentage of the population overall, but that, that loss of a number, that number of people affected the overall country and population considerably more as a sort of like a working population and so forth, you know, it really decimates the country when it had many people. Yeah, and, and, and civilians are being taken away as prisoners. Um, there's a good example, the, um, the second Earl of Northampton, um, whose headquarters was Banbury. Um, they did a raid on a village called Killsby. Uh, they went into Killsby, they took all the sheep and all the horses, and all the men, and well, took them off as prisoners. That leaves nothing, prisoners. does it? No. Nothing for the people uh, left behind, literally. Uh, and what, what ends up happening is all the women of the village roll their sleeves up, march to Banbury and demand all, the, all their, their men back um, because they, they, they can't survive without it. Yeah. Did they get their men back? Yes, they did. Oh, and they also yeah. got a, they did get a couple of horses as well, but they kept all the, all the cattle and the, 
and the sheep and, and so on That's and so a forth. Very brave thing to do. You, you actually find that quite a lot during the Civil War that um, the women are very much standing up and they're, they're as much as involved as the men folk. Oh, that's, and, uh, I suppose they felt they had nothing to lose sometimes. No, no, and, and they had to had to do these things to yeah. to survive. So, right, so we get to the point where um, Charles raises his standard over Nottingham. That's it. They um, he goes he down like a neck balloon. <laughs> Yes, yeah. He, he's not safe in London. He doesn't feel safe in London, so he moves out uh, and then ends up going uh, up to Nottingham where he raises his standard. It's not quite as successful, perhaps, as he, he thought it would be. Um, because he thought everybody would come rally to his support and the, these few parliamentarian oiks um, wouldn't do anything. But, but of course, it didn't turn out that way. No. And um, support was equal. Mm. And one of, the, one of the problems that, again, I don't think Charles had actually thought it through uh, very well, was the fact that um, Parliament controlled all the main ammunition stores and all the armories in, in all, the, all the major cities and towns, particularly yeah. London. Okay, yeah. So even if he could, even if he could raise men to support him, he got no kit to fight with, or very little. No, yeah, no, no, no artillery. Oh dear, he didn't think things through at all, did he? No, no, <laughs> uh, and this is this is one of the big problems uh, that sort of develops out of it. It's it's, it's just highlights his impetuous behaviour all the way through. That sort yeah. of leads us up to the situation. Um, one thing that I did want to mention, because the as well, they had parliamentarians sort of had control of the navy and the trade as well, didn't they? Yes, yeah. Just an enormous boon financially, you know. It, it's yeah. it, it, war and troops and all these things cost inordinate amounts of money. Yes, is part yeah. of what got Charles into this mess in the first. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, that they had some really huge advantages over him in that respect. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a really, really difficult one. I'm not entirely sure. Um, so, yeah, so Charles just, just really didn't think at all well about a lot of the things he was doing. It was very characteristic of him and it kind of really brought him into this whole situation this impetuous behavior and because the others had all these advantages he then had to look strategically at what he did have and what he could acquire in a, in a bit in so he was able to move forward so after he raised his standard nottingham really didn't go very well at all no. he tried to march on london didn't he and, um, but it was blocked to him. What made him think that perhaps he would be able to succeed if he marched on London? Um, I, I think in the first place, he was actually trying to go the other way um, to secure, the, the again, the, the major arms stores. But it, even then, I, I don't think that either side actually expected a war to take place. I think they just thought it would be a bit of posturing. Um, and then one side or both sides would, would back down. Hopefully, in Charles's point of view, that Parliament would back down. Yeah. But of course, they, they didn't do that. Um, they raised quite a large army, um, which came from all the a lot of the major areas. Uh, they assembled at Northampton, um, the Parliament's army under the Earl of Essex, um, and then Charles comes the other way as well. And um, there are some minor skirmishes take place in Worcestershire and around Worcester. Um, by this point, we also introduce a new character who's Prince Rupert, who's Charles's nephew, uh, and he's arrived in England. And, and Rupert is very much uh, the dashing uh, war hero, yeah. uh, impetuous, uh, which gets him into trouble a few times, to be honest, over, over time. Um, but but you then have that. So, 
and then the two armies then come together and clash um, at Edge Hill, which is the first proper battle mm. uh, during the Civil War. Uh, and I suppose it was a bit of a draw, really. Um, neither side had the had the one advantage over the other one uh, as part of it. Um, and they go away both thinking that they've done really well, where <laughs> in reality, um, nothing really happened. And, and it's at that point then that the Royalist army then heads down to London mm. and there's a battle at Turnham Green. Yes. Uh, which, which is their attempt to get to London, but they're blocked. Uh, and at that point then, Charles then goes off to um, Oxford and that's where he sets his headquarters up for the whole of the war, really. The ch um, when they were trying to march into London, this is a little sort of Tudor thing, isn't it? It isn't, it's not. They were, hmm. the, the, the guy who sort of was at the head of block in the moment was Robert Devereux, if I pronounced that correctly. Yeah. Devereux. Yep. Now, he was Earl of Leicester. Essex. Leicester. Essex. Essex. I've got myself very confused now. But he has, um, yes, Essex. He has um, a well-known Tudor relation, doesn't he? Yeah. So yeah. can you trace that back for me? So it goes from Elizabeth's favourite, doesn't it? Robert yeah. Dudley. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's through the female line. You can have to forgive me because I'm having a senior moment and can't remember that. <laughs> so did I. I couldn't even remember whether or not it was Leicester or Essex. But it's yeah. like his um, grandson. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I just yeah, thought I'd say that it was like a Tudor tidbit. As, as like you know, <laughs> the kind of thing. It's, yeah. it's, as you say and that highlights again though what you were saying earlier about how this is only 40 years since the death of elizabeth and the fact that you've yeah. got the grandson of this very prolific figure from the elizabethan period shows again it, it sort of condenses the time for me yeah it, it shows yeah. you how close together all these things were happening to, to me that yeah. kind of makes it identifies that these things were actually not that far apart no, no. And, and when, when you initially do think of it you, you actually see, think of it as the elizabethan period was something way back mm. and, and we have this huge gap and we have the the civil wars when in reality they're not they're they're, they're next door to each other yeah well it was less amount of time than elizabeth's reign yeah exactly uh, and and less time than, than the whole of the wars of the roses yeah so it's when you look at it like that they're long you think oh however many years is a really long time but in terms of the history and how much it happened it's quite a small pocket of time really it, it's a blink of, blink of the eye and when you think that it's been however many years since the end of the second world war oh yeah when yeah and that doesn't even somebody who was like myself you know, we were obviously born way after that period but even that doesn't seem possible no no you know it's there there's certain things make me feel my age <laughs> <laughs> um so one more battle i feel that it's worth mentioning here i hope you agree is the battle of marsden moor so yes there, there was a little bit more of significant an outcome at marsden moor wasn't there marsden marsden moor it leads things on to to another stage more or less um the the parliamentarians uh, were laying siege to york at the time and it didn't look like there was anybody who could really stop them however prince rupert does this dashing mad charge from central england right up into yorkshire collecting men and arms as he goes and manages to break the siege um of, of, actu of it actually happening um the two sides then come together uh, at Marston Moor uh, during the daytime and they think that they're not going to fight at night. One of the thing, one of the big distinctions of the, of the Marston Moor is supposedly we talk about Towton in terms of the bloodiest battle in English history. Marston Moor's considered the largest battle. There are more men taking part in, okay. in the Battle of Marston Moor than, than any other um and and so the the royalists all go and sit down and put their tents up and think they're going to have their dinner 
uh, in sort of like the early evening and Parliament decides to attack, catches them completely off guard. Um, and by, also by this point, the Coventer army had actually crossed over the border and this was something else that Pym had been working on, is that the, the Scottish Coventers um, had actually joined up with, with Parliament's army. So they, they had a massive army by this point. Uh, and the the Scottish army had joined up with the English with the Parliamentarian army, uh, and um, so there was this huge battle at, at Marston Moor. Uh, I wonder if Charles would have. I'm sure he wouldn't have predicted that the Scots were going to do that. No, no, I don't think he expected. <laughs> but but of course, <laughs> don't forget in the second second civil war they they change sides. They they do. That's a that's a bit of a juicy one next time, isn't it? A bit of skullduggery, yes. bit of skullduggery. Um, so we kind of said we obviously we talked about this everybody beforehand because there's so much of it. We're going to roughly draw a line here at this point for today, and um, because it's not too long after this really that this first civil war of the civil war starts to wrap up doesn't it yeah well um, you, you've still got a, a year or so and you've then got the the big battle of the civil war which is naseby uh and we'll talk about that next time yeah uh of a lot of people associate obviously the civil war with the commonwealth and oliver cromwell and he'll start to edge his way in shortly won't he he's on his yeah, way uh, uh, he's on his way at this point, although uh, Cromwell's getting more important, he's still not a huge player in the in the overall game. Yeah, it, it isn't until later on that that he starts to become more and more. Although he again, he's an MP and he's been politically active. Um, we don't get this major thing until a lot later. Yeah. So, oh, he was a cad, that man. Yeah. <laughs> he's, the, he's the marmite he's the marmite man you either love him or hate him yes i don't i don't like oliver cromwell <laughs> i need to um look at this because he is um i mentioned this when i was speaking to philippa a few weeks ago there is a not direct line of descent between him and thomas cromwell yes it's a little bit more picky isn't it it's um, well um a little bit complicated, I think. Actually, his his great grandfather, I think it was his great father, the, the Cromwell's name was actually Williams. Um, and great granddaddy Williams goes and marries Thomas Cromwell's sister. Right. Okay. Um, and at that point, to, so they seemed more important than perhaps the family was at the time. Ah, righty ho. The, they they changed their name to um, to Cromwell, and and the the great. Uh, if you look on the, the earlier accounts of, of Oliver Cromwell's immediate descendants, you often see it written as Williams, um, stroke Cromwell, so they're still using it double barreled. So you see, that's uh, worth knowing because if people go away and do their own reading and research about this, they're going to come across that, and I wouldn't have known that, and I'd have found that very confusing. Yeah. So it's it's all these little tiny things like that that sometimes make studying history really really difficult. Uh, yeah, and extremely <laughs> complicated to yeah. to barrel down and work out where everybody comes from. Yeah, and they've all got the same. All, all the men are called Thomas, most of them, and yeah. all the women are called Elizabeth or Anne. And yep. Mary, and then they've got their sort of maiden names for the women, and then their titles, and it just all gets a little bit confusing. It's it's like having two million John Smiths. Yes, it really, really is exactly that, exactly that. And I, when we first come into history, I think to, you need just to read it on a fairly casual basis. That is actually really confusing, and it's one of the hardest things to get your head around not in terms of understanding that lots of people had the same name and lots of people had titles as well as christian names and, and their names or whatever but just remembering who is who is actually yes. quite a challenge in its own right i'm sure everyone can relate to that if i'm being quite honest <laughs> yeah. right so we will leave that there for today but there's lots of scope for lots more civil war 
and um, yes, it gets very juicy at points. It's, yes. It's, yeah. There is, there is so much to this, honestly. If people haven't read about this, I really would go and take some time. We were both saying um, Peter Ackroyd's book on the Civil War is a very good one if people want to read anything about the Civil War. Any more recommendations book-wise? Uh, it depends what you want, because there's so many books that have been written. There are um, are good overviews. The, 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 even in overviews, they, they they take overviews in different ways. I mean, like there's a, a very good book called The War of the Three Kingdoms, which looks at it from a um, from from a national international perspective. That makes sense. Yeah, and then you've got other books that f focus on really tiny pieces of it. Right. Um, or or somebody focuses on on the politics. Um, one of the things I will say, if anybody wants to look in ad advance of what we're going to be talking about next. Uh, a couple of the key points that we will be we, we have to mention uh, is the Battle of Cropperty Ridge, right? Which is quite a key battle. Not it, it's actually one of the first times that the Parliament actually loses the battle, but it's more important politically uh, and what happens because it's that's the birth of the new model army. Right, and I think that's um, something again that if people have very maybe briefly looked at this period. That's mm. definitely something that they've probably heard of. Yeah. Like a few key yeah. things like phrases like Brown Cavaliers, Rump Parliament, Long Parliament, Short Parliament. People might not necessarily know a huge amount of these things, but those are things that crop up quite a lot. Yes. Period uh, dramas, TV documentaries, short articles, and so on. And, and, and this is the beginning of the British Army we know today. Wow. Really starts at this point. So we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that and how how that develops and ends up at Naseby next time. Yeah, I, I need to do more Stuarts. I recently bought lots of books on the Stuarts and <laughs> I've got very far with them, but this definitely needs to be my next port of call, I think, moving a little bit forward. But then there's all these things I want to learn about the Angles and the Saxons. There's not enough time. Yeah. Oh, oh, and another one, my article which came out in the, the Tudor Life magazine this month, about enclosures um, have a read of that as well because that will give you some background of what's going on okay I, I, mine specifically northamptonshire focused but it's going on all over england yeah i was going to say that it wasn't just northampton it was i'm, I'm obviously I, I read the article because you sent it to me and then i moved it on to the editor so um yeah it's 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 very it's very interesting how and as you say it's not just that it like everything it's not just that in isolation and that also because you are talking about the, the common person as well in how they were affected that is another feature of peter Ackroyd's book isn't it is that yes. it's just looking at these events between all these people at the top it's what life is like and how and you mentioned earlier about how the common man was really affected Whereas in other wars, perhaps they weren't, or it was very isolated in certain parts of the country at a time. And people were really suffering. They were, yes. they were really suffering under Charles, the, the, the poverty and the neglect that they suffered during this period is, is really, really harrowing. It was not a fun time, anybody, really, at all. <laughs> Just which is why you you start to see a third army in england it's not an army as such but you, you get the clubmen which is the the people of the the towns and the villages clubbing together and beating off both sides because they've had enough of the war ah oh, that's why they're called the clubmen oh, they, they, they they carry clubs rather than, than proper weapons but, they just went for it <laughs> yeah but, but, to but they, they aid people i guess to just kind of say we don't want this it's out yeah. of our space yeah, yeah, and don't come into our town, basically, mm -hmm. or come into our village. Was that generally successful? Uh, in some cases, I think, yes. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah. We like an underdog. We do. <laughs> right. Thank you so, so much for your time. This I'm really looking forward to the next one already. My we'll pleasure as always. We will have to wait for the next one. But me and Mike will get to see it before you guys do. So. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much and we will be back soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.